Orana malu ilalai start again. Talufalava ki orana malu ilalai tinakoto kato. Welcome. My name is Glenn Donaldson. I'm the managing director for BGIS New Zealand. BGIS is pleased to support our way forward, the voice of business, Box Pops, as we see a strong alignment between our business and the topics in this series. Designed to inspire, this series consists of short webinars with moderated live discussions with leaders from a cross section of industries. The series will be an opportunity to learn from industry leaders about transformations of their businesses, resilience and leadership during challenging times, and future plans on sustainability, efficiency and innovation. In the box pop today, The Circle and BGIS are delighted to hear from Christopher Luxon, leader, National Party. Thank you for your time today. A bit of history, and then we can kick it off. Christopher Luxon is the leader of the opposition and the MP for Botany. He entered parliament at the 2020 election and was elected leader of the National Party in November 2021. Prior to entering parliament, Christopher was chief executive officer of Air New Zealand from 2013 to 2019. Under his leadership, the airline delivered record profits and all time high customer satisfaction scores and achieved its highest levels of staff engagement. Just a friendly reminder, we are on record today and we share the recordings on our YouTube channel following the event. We look forward to hearing your questions and we encourage you to use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. I'll now pass you on to Sharon Lloyd, CEO in New Zealand from The Circle and our guest of honour, Christopher Luxon, to get our conversation started. Thank you. Kia ora Glenn, great to have you with us again and thank you for the warm welcome. We appreciate the support of BGIS and I'd like to welcome all of your team that are with us on the line today as well. Christopher, kia ora and welcome to you. Great to have you with us today. Well kia ora, great to be with you Sharon and can I say thank you for the work that you do in the circle. It's really important stuff. Um, I've been I've followed your work for a long, long time. And can I also just acknowledge Glenn and uh, BGIS and just say thank you for your sponsorship as well. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Now, I want to take you back to 2020. What did you discover about New Zealanders during the initial COVID period? Well, look, I mean, it was, um, I thought New Zealand really rose to the challenge incredibly well. And I think in fairness, I felt that the government actually communicated very effectively. I thought they handled the response, you know, really quite well. Um, and, you know, I think we were all very proud about how Kiwis came together. I have a different view, I'd say from 2021 to 2022, it became a total shambles. But, um, but the reality is, you know, 2020, I thought as a country, we all unified, uh, we were all very clear about what we were trying to achieve together. Uh, and from, from, the, from the Prime Minister and the government to, to everybody in the public, I thought we did a good job. Brilliant. So fast forward to today and thinking about those major challenges, particularly for the business community, skills shortages, the ability to attract international talent, ESG, security, for example. How do we build a better and more comprehensive or transparent conversation between business and government? Well, like I guess, you know, I read a book when I was much younger by um, uh, Viktor Frankl, and he was one of the leading, you know, Holocaust. He, was, he survived the Holocaust. And he went on to become one of the leading psychiatrists in the world. And he wrote this book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, you know, he talks about essentially a commentary on Western civilization. And he talks a lot about, you know, essentially the business community being able to have a statue of liberty essentially on the, on the East Coast, but a statue of responsibility on the West Coast. And the metaphor is very simple that, you know, we want liberty and freedom to run our businesses as we see fit, but also we are part of a society that we need to contribute to and not just take from. And that there is responsibility there. So, you know, as a business leader coming through at Unilever and, in, you know, more recently at Air New Zealand, you know, I tried to think about the role of my business in something bigger than just the stakeholder, you know, the shareholder approach of maximizing profit and loss. Yes, getting commercial returns sorted and getting the commercials of the business strong was, was important, but realizing that you're part of something much bigger, which is called a society, and how do you actually do, do that? And I think, you know, the real opportunity in New Zealand is actually to say, look, we have some big challenges ahead of us. Um, we have some tremendous opportunities ahead of us too. Whether we resolve the challenges or convert the opportunities is really contingent upon how, how well the three big actors in society actually work together. And so community organisations, you know, and, and community, they see the pain point, the frustration, the hurt, the need up close, and they know how to deal with that and deliver, you know, for that and to, and to, 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 to support people in that flip space. You see businesses move with tremendous scale and speed, you know, when we wanted to do 
you know, family, I wanted to do family violence because I felt it was a workplace issue, not a social issue. Um, because if someone's got a break from a perpetrator for, for eight, eight hours, well, surely at Air New Zealand, then we could do something about it, particularly when it was taking women six to seven times to leave a bad situation. So why don't we do three weeks, you know, paid leave, it won't show up on your pay slip, you work with our chief medical officer, our legal team, White Ribbon, others, and we get all the logistics of it sorted. So when you're ready to go, uh, if we have to move you from Auckland to Christchurch, we can, and we can support you doing that, then that's great. And likewise, if you're a perpetrator of family violence, I felt there was something that I could do about that. And so, yes, you get a week's leave, but you've got to go on a pretty intensive uh, training and reprogramming uh, program. And so I think, you know, there's an example where you can move with great speed scale uh, as a business leader that you often can't do in government. And then government really lays down the train tracks and the, and the framework by which the three actors can all, all navigate. So between government, business, community, I think we need a coalition because we can each bring something different to the table under the, under the constraints of a society and actually deal with those challenges and those opportunities as we have ahead of us. Um, and, you know, my, my only criticism is, you know, without getting too political on you, I think the government today in New Zealand does too much centralisation and control and not enough trust and empowering those other actors in society, namely business and community, to be able to get on and get things done. It's been a common theme across the series, that focus on people and ESG, of course, is top of mind for our members. So appreciate mm. that. So thinking about those main concerns for the business community, what are the dangers we'll face if we don't address these challenges? And are you worried New Zealand will be left behind? Well, look, I think, you know, the bottom line for any business is, you know, if you can embrace sustainable development. And what I mean by that is in New Zealand, we've often mistaken sustainability to be just the environmental uh, stuff. But around the world, sustainability and sustainable development is understood as economic, social and environmental. And, you know, um, if you don't put in place a thinking that has a, a sustainability, sustainable development framework for your business, you don't realize that you're part of a mission and a purpose that's bigger than just making money. Uh, and, um, and you don't sort of really deal with those issues very well and integrate those issues into what you're doing. You move from a, a, a pure shareholder approach to a stakeholder approach in terms of how you run the business. Um, you lose your social license to operate, right? And you start to wonder why people are turning over and leaving your business because you don't have a mission, a purpose, a good, strong culture. If it's all just about cranking out the profit and loss, you know, I can tell you, look, anyone can work that out. I mean, like, it's not, it's just how do I get more profitable revenue? How do I keep my costs under control? And how do I make my investments right? Those are the three big sort of commercial things you're thinking about. Um, but, you know, you wonder in a world where we've got, you know, war for talent, lots of labor shortages, you know, people will vote with their feet and they'll leave your organization and go somewhere else where they think, Yes, there's a bigger mission and purpose because people are attached to that as much as they are to the financial pay packet. Now, certainly in a world where we've got high inflation, they're going to be very attached to pay packets as well. But people don't, def, you know, often leave jobs or, um, you know, if it, there's got to be other variables in place before that. It's just not all just pure cash. And sometimes business owners don't want to hear that, right? They think that it's all just because of the money they shot through. Well, actually, it might just be that you're not that good a manager. It might just be that you're actually not that compelling a, an inspire or, or, or give a compelling vision of sort of where the business is going and why someone should stay attached to it. So, so I think, you know, the reality is you've got, you've got customers, you've got employers, yes, you've got shareholders, uh, you've got other stakeholders in the business. And if you're not delivering for them, you lose your social license to operate. And I can tell you, you know, having looked at this really closely, every time I went down a road to try and improve, you know, you can say sustainable development, social, you know, and, you know, for example, diversity and inclusiveness, you know, I felt that, you know, all the research will tell you businesses that are more diverse have a 30% better profit result. I felt it was actually quite important in the New Zealand experience. I started, we were losing, you know, up to $2 million a week in our international division. We ended up, you know, we had 16% of our top 100 jobs held by women. We moved it very quickly through to 50, 50 or close to 50%. Um, and then we started moving forward because, and I felt that was one of the success drivers for me, for us at Air New Zealand was building a more diverse um, you know, management team as a result. Not just for the sake of diversity because it's cool or it's a topic of the day, um, be under no illusion, first and foremost, secure the commercial results and get the commercial framework in place. Uh, but if that's what, all it's about, it gets a bit boring after a while. So to, to make your company count, make it do something else. 
Yeah, and I would say from what we hear, purpose-led organisations are more important now than they ever have been. So yeah, yeah, and you learn that, eh? I mean, if you if you think about the non-profit sector, you know, they don't have big salaries to entice people to come and work for them. And that's what I learned a lot from the voluntary sector was they're all about mission and purpose. And actually, the profit sector, um, you know, when you can learn that, um, you, you see some great organisations that are non-profits, um, and they have to be great organisations because all they've got is mission and purpose to keep their people attached to them. They don't yeah. have pay. pay and money and other things right okay so let's move the dial slightly and talk about global supply and competitiveness yep. how do we pivot when we're experiencing such major business critical issues around supply chain and and delays of course and how do we retain our competitiveness as leaders on a global stage well look i think you know there's basically what's happened if you zoom out is there's been a big shift away from products to you know from services to products and that's what's really caused a lot of some of the global supply chain shortages as well as, as COVID disruptions. But then the supply chain implications of all of that are, are you know, is really what's flowed through as a change of consumer habit uh, from, from, from services to products. And that's led to the shortages that we've got. Um, so some of it we can control and some of it we can't. So then what you do is focus on the bits that you can control. So when you have an Auckland port, for example, that has abysmal on-time performance um, relative to what it should be or what benchmarking of good ports looks like, and you're at the end of the world on the receiving end of global supply chains and global shipping companies, uh, you have a responsibility to get that as sharp and as efficient and as good as it possibly can be. Because if I'm sitting in Copenhagen running a global shipping line, I'm really questioning why I'm sending my boats down to New Zealand when they keep missing their slots because uh, there's poor on-time performance capacity is not being managed uh, or, or reached at, at a place like ports. And it's the same on the Eastern Seaboard of Australia. Although I'd put it to you, I think the ports on the Eastern Seaboard, as bad as they have often been internationally, are actually in better shape than, than the port uh, of Auckland and New Zealand here. So I know there's a team that they'll work that around, but we need to get that sort of control of things we can control so we're not making unforced errors because as a small country, we're a price taker and all of that. Um, and if we don't get that sorted, it'd be very simple for a global shipper to say, look, let's just run you out as a hub out of Singapore, out of Sydney, rather than bothering to send our, our boats down here. So there's, I, I don't mean to focus on the ports per se, but it's illustrative of things that we can control. I think the second thing that businesses are doing a lot of is moving from just uh, assuming that they can always have access to a low cost global supply chain that arrives just in time to starting to realize that actually resilient supply chains um, are much more important. And so actually sourcing material closer to source and, and where they're likely to sell it, meaning you know, in this case, New Zealand or, or Australia, even in terms of manufacturing, uh, is actually something that people have realized, I think, through the COVID experience. It's just not low cost, leanest operation mm -hmm. globally sourced. It's actually you know, building a resilient supply chain is better than a, a low cost one in some ways. So I think those are the things that I think, you know, business people are starting to think about, I hope, a little bit more. Yeah. So looking at perhaps services versus products or products versus services, where do you see the new major markets of the future for business? Are there niche sectors we can identify and, and compete competitively in those? Yeah, look, I think New Zealand actually has a series of sectors that we could be doing, you know, I want us to do even better. And do you know what I mean? I think we could step up. You know, we, we lead the world in agriculture. We have the best farmers in the world. We feed 40 million people. We have 390,000 people, I think, employed in it. That drives 80% of our export earnings. And we, you know, generates $9,000 for every Kiwi in the country, right? So, um, but the question is, that's all great. And great that we are the world's best, but how will we stay the world's best in the next 10, 20, 30 years? And so in my case, we need to really, you know, really amp up big time our research and development spending in the agricultural tech space, because if we don't, the Danish and the Dutch um, really are the ones that probably are chasing us pretty hard at the moment. So, you know, we should be proud about it and then use our technology and our innovation to, to find new higher value sectors. And this is the biggest problem that New Zealand has in Australia to a lesser degree, but, but similar in some ways is that we've, we've got a productivity disease going on in our country where we've fundamentally struggled to generate through the products and services we sell. Um, we're not able to get, generate higher prices or more value. And as a result, we're not able to generate higher wages and salaries. And when we can't do that, we fundamentally end up in a place where um, you don't give people enough freedom or choice as to how they get to live their life. So the single biggest thing that we can do in New Zealand is actually to, to create a more productive economy because if we don't do that, uh, that's the way in which we can ultimately raise wages. And we've been in the bottom 30% of the OECD for some time now, uh, and we've really struggled. What we do is we work really hard in New Zealand. We actually are some of the hardest working people on planet Earth. So it's not like work harder, but we do need to work a lot smarter. 
And that then very quickly gets you to, well, how do you do that? How do you build a more productive economy? Well, first and foremost, it's education. Secondly, it's going to be about infrastructure. And thirdly, it's about unleashing enterprise and business, you know, and, um, and getting, getting, getting our frontier firms going out in the world and doing really well. So, you know, that, that's the biggest sort of challenge that I think New Zealand has going forward and, or the biggest opportunity as well. Nice. So looking at that productivity and, and the education system, how do we engage with youth and, and what does the pipeline look like for a very changed workplace of the future? Yeah, yeah, it's quite exciting, actually. I mean, um, I mean, it's exciting and scary at the same time, I suspect. I mean, the first thing I think we have to face up to is reality of where we sit in education terms in New Zealand. And I think, you know, the fact that we're only getting 60% of our kids going to school regularly at the moment is a real challenge. Um, you know, that's something I came through in the 80s and late 80s and 90s. And, you know, really, schooling was, you know, everyone went to school, right? Um, it was sort of a basic. And so there's a whole bunch of reasons for why that may not be happening. But we have to get our kids into school. When you've only got 60% of kids going to school 90% of the time or more, uh, that's not great. And when you go to some of our lowest decile uh, school areas, it's down to 40, low, low 40%. And the problem with that is we have to recognize that, you know, we want every five-year-old to have an equality of opportunity in this country where they actually can set off irrespective of their circumstances with the same shot at, at the Kiwi dream, whatever that is for them. Uh, and education is one of those rungs on social mobility that we really have to make sure is there because if it's not there, uh, then we're really consigning people to a, to a set of, a life with, with not as many choices or opportunities. And we have to create those opportunities and work really hard at solving those big problems that actually are getting in the way of an equality of opportunity for everyone. So, um, so that's why I'm so passionate about education. So if you can't get your kids to school you know, on time, that's a problem. Um, the second thing is that we have to face reality and say on maths, reading and science, our scores are amongst the bottom now of the developed English speaking countries on planet Earth. And we used to be for things like reading, for example, in really good shape. I think I read something this week that said the average, the 15 year old doing the minimum global reading test in the world that's used globally. You know, we only had 60% of our kids pass it. You know, so that means you've got, sort of functional literacy, illiteracy and numeracy sort of happening when you've got such poor scores. So, and it's something in, inside a country like New Zealand, you don't really feel it, right? Because you don't really know because your, your, your children are going off to school and you presume it's good and you assume it's good. Some parents have worked out over the COVID period, maybe the learning's not quite uh, where, where it ought to be. But the bottom line is we are in a competitive world with 195 other countries and 7.8 billion people. And we want our kids to be able to access those higher paying jobs uh, and the way they do that is through education. And that's what also gets us back into productivity as we talked about before, because we can access higher paying uh, sectors and, and, and innovation and, and, and businesses and products and services as well. So, so I think there's a lot that we've got to come back to and sort of and, and prescriptively sort of make sure things are teacher instructed, not necessarily child centered um, in, in, in the extreme. Make sure that we're doing structured literacy programs and, and teaching how we used to do some of this stuff and just do the basics well, you know, because if we can't do that, everything else becomes a bit immaterial. If we haven't got the, the human talent that can actually is well educated enough to go foot it with you know, the kids from Harvard and Yale or Oxford and Cambridge. And, and those are the kids that I competed with when I came through and built my career globally and was mm. offshore for 16 years. And, and my New Zealand state education and going to uni for the first time in my family, that, that all set me up really well. And I want that to happen for everyone else. So, so education is a really big one. Um, and then I think, you know, your point about the future of work and the reality being that, you know, every job is being impacted by the future of work. And, we should not be fearful about the robots are coming, as you often hear people saying, but it's a huge opportunity for a country like New Zealand because we have been, we tend to build our businesses relying on adding more labour units or labour uh, rather than actually investing in capital and plant to actually get more technology into them to get to higher productivity curves um, as a result. So, you know, there's a big opportunity. The ad adoption of technology would be very, very good for New Zealand businesses, given we we do it relatively poorly relative to other companies. I know we take pride as consumers in our adoption of technology, but actually um, our businesses tend to, as I said, invest in labour, not invest in, in plant and equipment. And we know, you know, just know in small businesses, if every small, you know, if the small businesses that adopt several cloud-based apps have a 30% higher level of profitability than those that don't because technology creates efficiency, productivity, and all that good stuff. So, so it's quite disruptive because you know, by my calculation, there's sort of 900,000 jobs that will be impacted at some point or created. 
but there'll be 700,000 jobs that'll be changed. So, you know, net, net, it could create 200,000 jobs for us. Um, some numbers I remember looking at in the New Zealand context from years ago, a couple of years ago, but, but you know, so, but it's got a big set of challenges and we don't want to leave people behind in that transition either in different regions of New Zealand, different sectors or different socioeconomic groups as well. So thinking about that, not leaving people behind, COVID widened the equality gap and probably highlighted the digital divide. So what role will business need to play in helping to address the, the change that's required around that to give those people access to the jobs of the future? Yeah, well, look, I think business can do a lot. I mean, I think if you just focused on your own employees and thought about what else could you be doing for them, you know, there's no reason why, you know, at New Zealand and at Unilever, we were running literacy programs, do you know what I mean? We were running budgeting programs, we were running a whole bunch of leadership development programs. Um, and so, you know, and, and why do you do that? You do it, A, because it's the right thing to do, B, it's actually good business sense to, to make those investments uh, in your own talent and your own people. So you've got the capability within your business as well. But it's just good for New Zealand ultimately as well. So, you know, I think there's quite a lot that we can be doing about that. Um, you know, um, and I think, you know, the other thing is, you know, there is, you know, a real need for us to get, you know, make sure there's no digital inequality. I was very struck recently with some things I was talking to some people about and realized that actually they don't have access to the internet to be able to actually have those conversations or have access to those opportunities. So, mm. yeah, there's a, yeah, we were, we we're proud. I'm very grateful that under a national government, we got an ultra fast broadband network that served us pretty well during COVID. But having said that in other parts of the country, and in certain challenging environments for, for other households, um, you know, that doesn't exist, right? And we forget that. And so we, we probably need to go again and, and redouble our efforts on making sure that, you know, rural black holes and, and, and connectivity uh, and how do we get it to, to families that desperately need it as well and devices and, and connectivity. Yeah, devices as well, absolutely. Yeah. So um, let's look at our relationship with Australia. There was um, global scrutiny on Australia and New Zealand, and it was a high on our COVID strategy, of course. So how do you see our recovery and position on the global stage as a result of that? Everyone looking at us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In what way? Sorry, what do you mean? Uh, just, I guess, <laughs> the, the scrutiny on us in this part of the world during COVID and how we responded and, and what, what our results were. How do you see our position on the global stage as a result of that? Yeah, well, some people will look at our results and say, yes, in terms of a health response, really great. But in terms of we've ended up playing quite a fearful, small, inward negative game in New Zealand, I'd put it to you, Australia actually has, done a, and has opened up pretty well. Do you know what I mean? If, the fact that you could you know, have a, uh, a t an Ashes test match and you could also have, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Australian Open going on in the middle of an Omicron crisis. They were clearly finding ways to be able to, to do that well. I think it doesn't really matter. Uh, I know New Zealanders like to take great pride in all of that, um, but the reality is the world's moved on. And actually the last year or so, at no rapid antigen test, very late, slow vaccination rollout causing 15 week, $8 billion lockdowns. You know, I'd, I'd come at it another way and say, yes, I get what you're saying around the health response, but um, not, not that difficult on two rocks in the South Pacific Ocean with a lot of water around you to shut the border down. Um, more difficult to think about how you now open up and get moving. And I think other countries have started to realise there's huge opportunities because they have started to get to issues that you know that they felt existed through the COVID period that they haven't invested appropriately in, in upgrading their countries. So the challenge for us is, you know, there is a global war for talent going on at the moment mm -hmm. in the world. New Zealand is shut for business. If, if you're an enterprising young person, you don't have New Zealand on your list. I appreciate we think it's a great country living inside it. But the reality is places like Canada and Australia are doing an exceptionally good job of reaching out to those workers to say, we want you, we welcome you to come to our country. And if you're sitting as a nurse or a doctor or a veterinarian or a mechanic or whatever it is somewhere in the world, um, you're weighing up a whole bunch of options. And it's not just New Zealand by default because we're a great place and we're lovely people. We're the best people on planet Earth and the best country on planet Earth, just putting it out there. But, um, you know, the reality is, you know, the person sitting overseas, you know, the best and the brightest, um, you know, if you want the best, you have to be the best. And you have an immigration department, frankly, at the moment, New Zealand doesn't have a pathway to residency. You know, perverse situation that I saw last week. I was in Otaki and, you know, the story of that doctor from Wales who had 1,300 patients who wanted to live here, wanted to have a pathway to residency, wanted to buy a house, get a KiwiSaver account, raise his kids here, do all that good stuff. No, um, he couldn't get a response from the immigration department after months. I just heard of a case this morning uh, waiting nine months to hear about the process for even pursuing um, residency and this person's been in New Zealand for a very long time as an Irish immigrant doing some mm. pretty cool things 
And so you sit there and go, whereas you know, Canada and Australia are doing a very good job of opening up their, their economy to it, working, realizing that they have to, it's a competitive market. They have to work really hard at it. It was interesting working holiday visas, you know, the backpackers that make so much of our hospitality sector work and our tourism sector work. Well, the Australians have opened up for tourism. They've been doing a good job of promoting, you know, backpacker holiday visas uh, to Australia, making some concessions, uh, extending them, making them more attractive. They've still only got a third of what they wanted, what they want and what they had before COVID. Well, New Zealand hasn't even started that conversation, right? So, so we have a lot of work to do, to be honest. You know, we've got massive labour shortages. Immigration's completely clogged up and shut down. There is no pathway to residency. And as a consequence, global applications and interest in New Zealand fell, fell through the floor a little bit in recent months because people think we're closed for business anyway. So, so it is realising sometimes in New Zealand, yeah, we have to realise our relative competitiveness. How are we doing relative to other countries on a range of economic, social and environmental criteria and, um, yeah, and, and actually having the real honest conversation, well, how good are we? Do you think there's more opportunity to collaborate with Australia or, you know, perhaps on immigration, but learn from one another or we could be doing more together? Yeah, well, I mean, it's our closest relationship. And for the Australians mm -hmm. watching, I mean, you know, I know personally, I'd, having lived there for five years and done a lot of business there, I mean, if we couldn't be Kiwis, I mean, we'd probably be Aussies. So, I mean, <laughs> um, although we won't say that too loudly, but, um, but you know, it's, it's a great place. We feel great affinity. You know, it's the closest relationship, I think, between two countries, really, that, that, that exist. And um, there's huge respect, I think, on both sides of it. Um, so there's always opportunities for us to collaborate. I mean, we were making good progress before covid to try and make it a more seamless travel connection experience. Um, there was a lot of commonality. We had a lot of children, you know, a lot of our kids going over to study in Australia, getting in and out between the borders, getting through airports, just some of those basic things that we took for granted, uh, but we worked quite hard at over a number of, of the previous 10 years to make it more frictionless to be able to, to connect together. But it all comes back to everything, right? People to people connections ultimately drive capital, data and information and business flows as a result. Um, 40 years of CER next year as well. Something yeah, exactly. To <laughs> be something to celebrate well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I just wanted to remind everyone on the line that we um, do have the question and answer function available as well. So if anyone's got a question for Christopher, I'm happy to raise that as well. So um, while we're waiting for those, I wanted to come back to you personally. You've got a private sector background. So what is your biggest asset you bring from this to your current role? It's like a yeah. job interview. <laughs> well, look, I've been been in politics for just over, I think I was elected uh, October 2020. And so um, it's been, you know, really fun 18 months and I really love doing what I'm doing. I guess I do come at it from the outside, though. I'm not a career politician who, who um, has grown up in the system and, and in politics only. And I think that's really helpful, you know, as you find in business coming often from a different sector or a different market or a different, you know, company can actually bring a lot of good challenge and provocation to a business. It's the same thing, I think, in the, the political system. The bits that's uh, similar is that, you know, if you're going to be a great CEO, you really want to be able to inspire people with a vision of where you want to take an organisation. I think you get really good at problem definition, which I don't think politicians do a very good job of. Often we've got solutions in search of a problem rather than a problem. Um, building the solutions for that, getting those results, but most importantly, getting things done through, with, and for people is a big part of, of, a, of a good CEO, a modern CEO's responsibility. So I think all of that is very transferable into the political domain. Um, and then I think the other bit that's relevant is, you know, we forget it, but I think politics, I don't even try and use the word too much. It's really about public service. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. We're going there to serve the public. Um, I'm going because I, I'm very grateful for the, you know, the upbringing I've had. I see the problems. I see the opportunities. I want them converted. I want to get things done. You know, and I think that's the thing is people, people want, that's how you improve people's daily lives, right? How do you make it a little less expensive, a little more convenient, keep the country a little more unified. That's what people are expecting us to do. Um, and so, you know, when you go with that mindset and you're connected to that mission and purpose, then you can take all the slings and arrows. Politics is a much more brutal sport than business. You know, it's much more personal, it's much more public. You get smashed around by people with all sorts of views and some seems really unfair and some, some is very deliberate and very political as people sort of light up attacks on you. But, um, but no, it's a real privilege to do the job. But I think I'm grateful for my business background because really, to be honest, to be good in business and large organisations, you need to be about people. And, you know, if you love people, which I do, this is a great job. Nice. And so if you were elected Prime Minister, what would your priorities be in the first 100 days? Well, 
that's the work that I'm doing with my MPs right now, because as you can imagine, I'm asking them to come forward with the three to five things that they would do from day one to get moving, because we don't want to be like the last government that was out of power for nine years, then came to power 230 something working groups later, we start thinking about what we're doing. We actually have to hit the ground running at 100 kilometers an hour. So um, I've got them all working on three to five big what goals, uh, one or two how goals about how they're going to do this job um, and, and carry themselves and improve themselves. But you know, getting back to the core issues, the biggest single biggest thing we can do is really power up um, the productivity of the economy. And it gets into that conversation we talked about before about education, infrastructure and unleashing enterprise so that business people here want to take a chance in New Zealand and actually go off and find an export customer in Australia or somewhere in the world or open up Indonesia and Southeast Asia under the RCEP agreement um, and, and do some stuff, right? Um, so, you know, really that's, that's a big part of it. And I think the other piece is, I do want the country to be more confident, aspirational, ambitious, positive, optimistic. I think we've been way too internal, inward looking, negative, fearful. And I think, you know, it's that mindset shift that you're looking for as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, a lot of work to do, but certainly infrastructure, education and unleashing enterprise would be good starts to drive into that productivity piece. And then we've got to deal with breaking cycles of dependency and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other issues. But, but those would be the initial starting point. Good. Uh, now, We've got a question here. How do you see New Zealand's geopolitical role in the emerging big power changes now in Europe and Pacific? Yeah, really good question because in the old days, you know, we could have a structure where we had all our commercial interests in China, but all our value sitting with the West essentially. Uh, and, um, you know, New Zealand will need to stand up for its values as a liberal democracy. You've seen that happen with the um, you know, you've seen the importance of why our values matter a lot in Western liberal democracies as, you, as you've watched the Ukrainian-Russian uh, crisis happen. Um, so I think, you know, we've got to be prepared to stand up for our values and mm. live with the consequences of that from time to time. Um, but equally, um, we should be able to have robust relationships with all of our friends and partners. And even in, in, in a place like China, for example, as we do with Australia, where we have disagreements, if there's high trust, you can actually raise issues of concern and the relationship between both of you and do so, I think, in a very good, honest broker kind of way. So, you know, New Zealand will always have an independent foreign policy. Um, we need to protect and stand up for Western liberal democracies because it's so important. But we also need to be able to, you know, have honest conversations with our friends and our partners and, and uh, be able to move them in ways too. Complete change of a topic, but who was or is your business mentor or political mentor, mentor and why? Yeah, I think on the business side, I was just really lucky that when I started out, I was quite conscious of looking at the pros and cons of the different managers that I had, you know, and I actually used to write them down as to what they did well, what they didn't do so well. And so, and tried to sort of build that into my own skill set as I went through building my own career. So for me, there were pieces of things that I got out of different um, business mentors or leaders that I had along the way. Um, and some were really great at encouraging me to embrace risk really intelligently. Um, and others gave you, you know, an organizing concept or thought that just changed the way you thought about things or, or educated you in some form. So for me, it was great because I was at Unilever and I built my career there for 18 years and 16 overseas. And so you got to work with a diverse range of people on a diverse set of business experiences, turnarounds, startups, realignments, sustaining success. Uh, and all of those require different leadership skills in, in different business situations. So business was a bit more, um, you know, that way. Um, and then I think on the political side, I um, mean, there's been, again, a number, but, you know, I really admire Barack Obama and the way he carried himself through uh, the presidency. I admired him so much. I brought him out to New Zealand um, a few years back <laughs> and, um, and Amanda and I went and spent the night and had a lovely dinner with him. Uh, and it was just great because he was, you know, while well, we don't agree on everything politically, you know, the bottom line was I really admired the way he carried himself and the team around him that actually delivered some, you know, um, you know, didn't have any scandals. It was sort of um, a complementary team, some very different personalities in that group uh, that was assembled uh, to, to get the best out of him as a leader, I think, as well. So I admired the team around him as much as um, and how he managed to get all of that chemistry coming together. But to be honest, the way, the, in both cases, business or politics, the way I've learned the most is by reading. Um, and so since I was a young boy, I've read a lot, but I've, you know, tended to, since I was probably 17, 18, take a leader and I just study that leader all year, you know, just for a full year. And I read six or seven books and watch a bunch of movies or documentaries about them and sort of work out what they did well, what they didn't do so well. 
um, and you learn from those experiences. So, you know, the last few years, I think I've gone through, you know, Lee Kuan Yew and Teddy Roosevelt and Bobby Kennedy and John Howard and, you know, just a bunch of, you know, not, not necessarily locked into a political ideology or tradition or, or party, but actually just looking at leadership in general about how, how you become a better leader. Um, and so I think there's a lot that people can do to propel your own learning. You know, I think in organizations, people rely on organizations to give them, you know, training at the beginning, but you get to a point where you should know yourself and, and, and be honest with yourself about what you are good at and where you need, when you're at your best and when you're at your worst and, and how, what are your development areas and, and get working on those things. And I think you can drive a lot through self-learning and, and, and ed education. I like the insights on Obama's team. That's that's a lovely way to, to look at it. And I think that it's interesting to get an insight into people's personal lives, right? When we're on the Zoom medium and your bookcase behind you is beautiful. So we can see you're into reading. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. We love it. So um, my last question for you is leaders are people too, of course, and leadership can be a lonely place. So how do leaders not run dry in times like this? Or how do you find your balance? Well, I think there's probably several thoughts but the first one I'd say is it's really important to get connected to mission and purpose you know um, I've met a lot of successful people in, in my life and I remember in my late 30s you know you, I remember meeting quite a lot of people in their 70s and 80s and some had chased success and then they realized there was actually no legacy that they were leaving behind and they were desperate to create one and I think you know the people that I've admired um Bono from U2 is a classic one for me. You know, he wakes up each day wanting to be the most successful, you know, front person for a rock band. Um, but he's taken all those skills, abilities, and experiences that made him a really great uh, U2 front man for what, 40 years now. Uh, and he's hooked up to a mission and a purpose bigger than himself, which is the one campaign. He spends half his time now, yep, being the front man for U2. And he wakes up every morning wanting to make great music and do all that good stuff. But he also spends half his time on the on the on on poverty issues around the world as well. And so, how do you live a life of success and significance? Not or, but and. And you see a lot of people chasing success, but not necessarily significance. And that might not mean public significance. It might mean you know the relationship you have with your partner or your adult kids, or how you want that to look and feel, or the impact you have in your community or your family. But I think that's the trick is how do you get connected to a mission and purpose? And that's really about taking the skills, abilities and experiences you've been given or got or developed uh, and hooking it up to a purpose bigger than yourself. And that's how you live a life of success and significance. I think the second big thing for me is that I remember when I was in Toronto in Canada and a guy came and saw me and he was in his, I must have been early 50s at the time and I was in my early 40s. And he said to me, Chris, I'm really stressed out. And he was a CFO of a big company there. And I said, he said, like, I'm just not happy. I'm going home sort of angry at my partner and my kids and um, disengaged. And I think what's really important for all of us is that you kind of have to manage in the four different energies. You know, there's mental energy, there's physical energy, there's social, and for want of a better word, spiritual or your emotional energy. And I think each of those things, when we get stressed and we get unbalanced, it's because we're not balanced in those types. So in this case, this guy was working 100 hour weeks, you know, doing work, 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 exercising his brain. He was out of shape physically, socially, he wasn't interacting or filling his soul up with people that he does life with. And he didn't really have a lot of meaning or purpose to what he was doing in his life either. And so I think, you know, what I've tried to do is with Amanda, my wife, you know, just take stock each year and just check in and say, right, I you know, where are we on those four dimensions? Um, how do we balance uh, those things? Because I think you get stressed when you overwork one and you get unbalanced in the others. And um, and so, yeah, so they're good to have a, an accountability friend, whether it's your partner or whether it's a bunch of friends that you might have that just call you. Sometimes they care about you more than you care about yourself and say, actually, Sunshine, I don't think you're doing, you know, I don't think you're being intentional with your, you know, like for me, I need to crank up the music and hang out with people that know me, love me for who I am, not because of what I do, you know, my job titles, right? They just are people I want to do life with, with all its ups and downs and uh, ugliness and, and highlights and triumphs and setbacks and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, that's how you fill up your soul so that you can go back out in the next week and sort of actually give out to a lot of people when you, when you don't get a lot of giving, get, getting filled up in again. So I think, you know, but those are things that leaders need to take stock of and, and think really intentionally about for themselves and what works for them when they're at their best, when they're at their worst, um, what triggers that uh, and build self-awareness. Yeah, 
Beautiful. It's all about the people again, right? <laughs> it is. It's all about people. Everything's about people. Everything's about relationships. Not networking. Relationships are different things. They are. Yes, indeed. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to spend this time with you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and appreciate your time. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dora Berra, to formally thank you. Thanks, Sharon. It's been great being with you. Thanks, Sharon. And thank you, everyone at home, for joining us today for our Our Way Forward, the voice of business, Box Pop, brought to you by BGIS New Zealand. On behalf of The Circle, thank you so much, Christopher, for participating in today's series. It was a pleasure hearing your insights today. Thank you to Glenn and the team at BGIS New Zealand for partnering the series. In our Box Pop series, we have been joined by Sophie Maloney, CEO at Sky New Zealand, Chris Quinn, CEO of Foodstuffs North Island, and Blair Turnbull, Chief Executive at Tower Insurance, with many more New Zealand leaders to be announced shortly. You can view all of our recordings on our YouTube channel, as well as this one, following the event. We look forward to welcoming you all shortly, and I hope you all have a lovely, wonderful day. Thank you.